we want to go technicalities or we're going to slow through it anyway. So, sorry about that. Anyway, you've all found yourself uh, to the University of Lone Ball Center. I was the June meeting, 2023. Uh, I am the president, Charlie. 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 So, uh, Can, uh, as usual, usual we are recording this and then uploading to youtube uh, we need to uh, we just have to that together. Uh, also as usual we're going to have our club seat or our guest speaker speak to us first and then we'll have a meeting business meeting afterwards that we might do that uh, but some of you if you want to escape and not do the business meeting because you just want to see the speaker you might like to do that so and our speaker tonight no so tonight we are bringing back a uh, repeat speaker we enjoyed several times in the past, and Jim Shedlowski. And Jim is a longtime member and former treasurer of the Warren Astronomical Society and rockability legend. He says he worked for 36 years as a vehicle development engineer manager, especially in acoustics and noise and vibration, and he retired in 1999. He graduated from right here, the University of Michigan in 1960. Oh, yes. <laughs> he did a degree in engineering physics and spent two years as an artillery officer in the US Army in Germany. In his spare time, he wrote and recorded music for Epic and Roulette Records as one of the Ski Brothers. Yeah, Dick Clark's American Bandstand in 1958. A lot of you maybe don't remember that, so this too. And due to that interest, including observation and outreach, and almost several telescopes, but in recent years, his passion for astronomy, it's not an astronomical history of technology has become a major factor. He is the vice president and historian of the McMaster Astronomical Society. And has visited a number of major observatories. He and his wife Winter in Mesa, Arizona, which is a great place for observing. A lot easier to make the right weather call for an open house, too. <laughs> and he participates in activities of the Space Station Mountain Astronomical League. He in the Old Arizona Messier Marathon in March 2009, earning a certificate for observing 104 Messier objects on one. And I would say that Jim always likes to finish his talks with a song and a dance, but the dance would be a lie. <laughs> with that, Jim shut up. <laughs> Don't do any more dancing, so because <laughs> of the back operation. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Charlie. You're welcome. Can you all hear me out there? Yeah. Hey, it's kind of nice to visit campus again. Uh, like I say, it was 1960 when I graduated. From the university here and, uh, things have changed a lot. We were at that time we were just moving on to North Campus. Most of our most of my classes were here on the main part of the campus. I actually was a lab partner to Ed White, uh, one of the early uh, astronauts, the guy who made the first spacewalk. Uh, Shortly and died in a four one club. <laughs> and uh, I also have two granddaughters who are going to school here right now. One of them just graduated two weeks ago. We were up here for the commencement. I'm not a junior. <laughs> and son just graduated from high school and he just got admitted to the university. The census is part of, you know, his take on the whole body. So, well, I'm a Michigan guy. All right. Uh, Mr. Rick, you can have an eyeliner. That's a number. Yeah, they had to get about 30 million little clams to get enough uh, purple dye to uh, dye the emperor's clothes. I mean, that's why purple is like the most expensive color. Yeah. Oh, okay. Bill Bryson. 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 Bill B
Huh? Bill Bryson. Bill Bryson. I have read his. A walk in the Woods is the one where he walks the, uh, the Appalachian, Appalachian Trail. Trail. I've read that. And then the brief yeah. history of almost everything is one of the yeah, and the body is white. Guide for occupants. But you know, he's everything he writes has this great sense of humor and which threatened to interfere with the important mission of the LSST. This information got my attention and excuse me. And after a bit of research, I found out that Musk's enterprise was just the tip of the iceberg for a much wider problem with the potential for serious consequences for both professional and amateur astronomy in the near future. That of extraterrestrial light pollution caused by objects orbiting the Earth. This evening, I hope to enlighten you a bit about the nature of the beast and how it has struck up, has snuck up on us astronomers with little attention paid to it until recently. I should point out this presentation is addressing a subject which is very controversial, is developing rapidly, even as we sit here tonight, and one which we are likely to experience major events in the very near future. In fact, this presentation is likely to be out of date soon. And as a matter of fact, since the meeting notice was sent out, I've gotten two emails from uh, a couple of them from Jack with with uh, studies that have been done on a very high level. One of them was a United Nations one and another uh, industrial consortium yeah, I about yeah. this very subject. But I, I have a slide there I'll show you a little bit later on. From an astronomer's perspective, orbital light pollution is extraneous light which interferes with observations that results from the reflection of sunlight from objects in Earth orbit. I'll get into a description of the characteristics and growing size of this cloud of operational and defunct satellites, as well as various pieces, parts, and fragments of man-made stuff circling the Earth. But I'd like first to go back 20 years to August of 2003, when I had my very first experience with this phenomena in a rather dramatic fashion. I had recently retired and rekindled my lifelong passion for astronomy. I had just joined the Warren Astronomical Society, purchased my first serious telescope, a Mead LX90 eight inch Schmidt cast. And, and as some of you may recall, some of you are too young to recall back that far. Some of you may recall, uh, the, the, in August of 2003, that Mars made its closest approach to Earth in 60,000 years. Remember those internet posts that declared that, quote, Mars will appear as large as the full moon. Right, yeah. I was at a dark sky site way out in the boonies near my cottage near Higgins Lake, Michigan, with my brand new telescope, waiting patiently for Mars to rise in the east. When I noticed dew beginning to develop on my corrector plate, in a panic, I grabbed a folded newspaper. I didn't have electricity, on there, so I'm running on batteries, no, no dew heaters. So I grabbed the folded newspaper and began to fan my corrector plate and the dew began to disappear. While fanning and staring at the dark northern sky, I noticed a faint point of light moving south. I thought, the satellite. All of a sudden, this barely visible point of light exploded into a brilliant spotlight. As I stood there, dazzled by this searchlight in the boonies, it faded as suddenly as it appeared. I left that evening wondering what in the heck I had seen. And oh, by the way, I did have a nice view of Mars a little bit later on. 
But it was the next week at a Warren meeting when I discovered what I had experienced that night. During, we used to have a segment called Ask a Stupid Question at, the, at our meeting. <laughs> when, 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 uh, during that Ask a Stupid Question segment, I described what I had seen and when I had seen it. And someone suggested that it was probably a, anybody? An iridium flare. I soon discovered what this phenomena was all about. And for the next 10 years or so, it became one of my favorite astro show and tell items at Star Party. Yeah. Iridium flares, which are no longer with us, exhibited many significant characteristics that are important in discussing orbital light pollution. During their show and tell era, the Iridium network of 66 satellites, which furnished a worldwide telephone service at the time, by a design quirk, caused a brilliant beam of sunlight to be reflected to Earth off one of its highly reflected antennas in a precisely predictable manner. You could look up the information ahead of time on heavensabove.com. You could look the information up ahead of time and impress your star party guests by pointing to a spot in the sky and counting them, counting it down to a five to 20 second light beam, sometimes as brilliant as 30 times that of Venus to a magnitude of minus 9.5. Wow. I got a thunder from one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so why and how did a novelty like this entertaining Iridium flares morph into a phenomena that may threaten observation of astronomy as we know it? Like other types of pollution, orbital light pollution started with a total lack of appreciation for the potential consequences from of contributing an unwanted something, in this case, photons, to the near space area surrounding Earth. As with other forms of pollution, the problem started off slow and not noticeable, as is shown on this NASA graph on the right-hand side, which shows the growth of objects tracked larger than a smartphone. That's, that's the smallest ones we can track at this point larger than a smartphone in Earth orbit up to 2019, when the first batch of Starlink satellites was launched. In the left-hand table are shown estimated numbers of smaller objects, too small to track. Each of these objects, illuminated by sunlight, reflects a quantity of photons back to Earth. As the quantity of these objects increases, the number and density of the associated photons increases from a hardly, de hardly detectable novelty to, as we shall see, a measurable quantity. With the advent of the Starlight Starlink era, which we'll discuss in a moment, again, as I shall explain, a major explosion of orbital objects and its associated photon pollution is on the horizon. The light pollution from all these objects displays itself in two distinct modes, satellite streaks and sky glow. Satellite streaks are the tracks of light that may cross the path of a telescope while it is gathering data. Because the streaks can be comparable to or brighter than the astronomical object targets themselves, their presence may compromise or completely ruin a data line. While the damage will be the greatest to wide field telescopes, such as the new Vera Rubin telescope, as we mentioned earlier, all telescopes are at risk. Even images from orbiting telescopes, such as the Hubble, have been ruined by satellites passing through. As the number of orbital objects increases, so will the problem. Second form of orbital light pollution is lesser known since it has a more subtle presentation, which has been growing incrementally since the beginnings of the space age. Orbital sky glow is an increase in night sky brightness caused by the sunlight reflected and scattered by each of the large number of orbiting objects, large and small, whose integrated radiance is a diffuse component when we observe with a naked eye or low angular resolution instruments. 
In 2021, the Royal Astronomical, Astronomical Society, in response to the advent of the Starlink era, which has been starting right about that time, performed an analysis of sky glow caused by the 9,300 tons of material in orbit prior to the deployment of the projected satellite constellation. Their results were surprising in that they found that at that point, before the Starlink era, the sky glow, or more specifically, the night sky brightness, had already been increased by approximately 10% over the brightness of the night sky determined by natural sources of light. Ironically, this was the same amount of brightness as set by the International Astronomical, Astronomical Union in 1979 as not to be excited when you are sighting an astronomical observatory. So, how much of an effect to the night sky brightness will adding 50 to 100,000 new satellites to that initial orbital inventory of about 6,500. Will we find out after the fact? <clears throat> so the use of orbital space has increased for various purposes since Sputnik was launched in 1957. Humanity has become increasingly dependent on GPS for navigation, weather and environmental monitoring, time sinking for financial services, security and military monitoring, and other orbital satellite dependent services. Communication and internet services have also been enabled by satellites for decades, but not until recently has an affordable, high speed, low latency satellite internet service been available. It seems that Elon Musk has finally solved the many problems that have stymied earlier attempts to furnish such a satellite-based internet system that will be available to all the rural and remote regions on Earth, which can compete with the various ground-based systems usually found only in urban areas. By combining a much lower launch system from SpaceX's reusable Falcon rocket system, with small high-tech satellites, which are mass produced at a, at a rate of 45 per week at their Redmond, Washington plant, Musk and his engineers are in the process of developing a worldwide internet system of staggering economic potential. Musk has been quoted as saying that, quote, profits from Starlink will finance my starship to Mars. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the deployment of the first phase of the Starlink system aroused the belated, the belated air, ire of the astronomy community. With over a million customers as of December 22 for the Starlink system, which is less than 25% deployed, many competitors have entered the competition. Many of these are shown on this slide. When I started researching this information, I began to realize how the astronomy community was kind of blindsided. When Musk and just a few others started rethinking the possibilities of high speed, low latency, low Earth orbit satellite internet systems, they realized before the rest of the world, the factors that would enable such a system to be affordable to the vast potential market of underserved customers around the world. At that time, some three or four years ago, when the first Starlinks were launched, other companies started jumping on the bandwagon and with projections for possible increasing the density in low Earth orbit by, uh, by factors of 10 to 30, the astronomy uh, community and other parties began to pay attention and belatedly asked questions like, how many satellites can space accommodate? Or what happens if that space is exceeded or if that limit is exceeded? What about collisions and how will the astronomical observations and discoveries be affected? These questions and others regarding how all this happened has caused a great deal of controversy, controversy and confusion in the media. 
which changes rapidly as new developments occur. My research over the last several years was confusing in the sense that the whole low Earth orbit satellite scene was and is changing commercially and technically. And the awareness of its implication was just being grasped by the various affected parties. I was at first dismayed that I could not find a single book that dealt with the subject because of its vol current volatility. And much of the online references had to be carefully screened to check for timeliness, bias, and relevancy to the astronomy aspects. And so it was with a sense of relief that some months ago, I came on an article in one of my favorite technical magazines that captured the subject quite well. This four page article in April of 2022 issue of Physics Today by a veteran science writer with a respected science magazine has effectively summarized the astronomical dilemma after securing input from the cost of the astronomy community. It's available online and I would recommend it to any of you who are interested in a compact perspective on this subject. I'd like to read the first paragraph of this article, which concisely summarizes the problem. Quote, several hundred thousand satellites could encircle the Earth in low Earth orbit by 2027, according to the estimates based on license applications to national and international communication regulators. That's up from 6,300 active and defunct satellites today and 3,300 in 2019. Also in this article, there's another quote from professional astronomer Samantha Lawler, who studies the Kupier belt at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan, Canada. She says that when Starlink and others have put up 65,000 satellites, that one out of every 15 points of light you see in the sky will be a moving satellite. Mm -hmm. Or this quote from the Rubin Observatory's chief scientist, Anthony Tyson, quote, with 100,000 satellites, every Rubin exposure, an average of 825 pairs per night, will have at least one satellite streak across the focal plane, which will, quote, need to be masked out at the cost of lost survey data. So the question that must be asked is, how did we get into this situation? The conditions that brought us to this point have to do with entrepreneurs, technology, competition, bureaucracy, and finally, the lack of attention by us, the victims. That's us astronomers. All of these factors came together at a time in history when world events also came into play. Let's take a look at how each of these considerations has contributed to where we are at and what the future may hold. The compelling economic incentives for this new version of internet connectivity are related to the huge size of the potential customer base, which can be gleaned from this article or this quote from Chad Anderson, the CEO of Space Angels and leading venture capital firm in the space business. He said, quote, you can see the clear profit motive here for Amazon. Four billion new customers. Mm -hmm. Amazon's Jeff Bezos Project Coupier is one of Elon Musk's Starlink most serious competitors to reach any point on the globe with high speed internet. Musk's Starlink system already has four, uh, has over a million customers as of December of last year in 34 countries in a system that while only 25% deployed is the furthest along in its deployment. The magnitude of the potential market, many tens or even hundreds of millions of new customers and thus the economic incentive to investing billions of dollars is shown in this slide, which shows that the global satellite internet market is expected to grow from $2.93 billion in 2020 to over $18.5 billion in 2030 for a compound annual growth rate of 20.4%. Part of this amazing growth 
has emerged from the natural incentive of the world's underserved populations to join the communication network we call the internet. As a new technology such as a high speed, low latency internet becomes available to previously unavailable remote areas, there's a natural inclination of individuals to quote, join the web. Also for the last three years, as this technology has been rolling out, a worldwide major disruption has created a positive distortion in this natural growth. Anybody think of what it was once? A pandemic. As physical isolation and lockdowns invaded life around the world, education and business became ever more dependent on virtual communication, such as Zoom and WebEx and the, and the like. And the availability of a high-speed connectivity became high priority, even in remote or rural areas. Government agencies, businesses, educational authorities, and other entities have stepped up efforts to furnish or subsidize these kinds of services, thus creating additional market growth. Second factor driving the movement toward crowded orbital space is the dramatic reduction in cost to create a constellation of satellites. One of the main contributors is the re re recent and rapid evolving of private and commercial companies with rocket systems capable of launching payloads into low Earth orbit. With Musk's SpaceX SpaceX's reusable Falcon rockets leading the way, the cost to place a given payload into space has significantly been reduced in recent years. The cost per pound for to lower low Earth orbit, which just a few years ago was just over $8,000 for a, $8, a pound for a ride on a Russian Soyuz, or 8,500 pounds on a Atlas V, or 5,400 on a Delta Heavy, has fell down to about $1,100 per pound for SpaceX's reusable workhorse Apollo 9, or $680 per pound for a Falcon Heavy. Furthermore, there are very many competitive company or companies that are facing SpaceX's dominance in this market, which re will result in further competitive cost incentives. Musk, for example, suggests that the cost to low Earth orbit for his new Starship launcher, when it becomes operational, will be around $90 a pound. Not $9,000, but $90 a pound. Wow. We could launch some. Complementary factor to the lower launcher cost is the dramatic reduction or miniaturization of everything electronic, digital, and in particular, satellites. Cube satellites are a large factor in allowing for the democratization of space. Compare a Starlink satellite at about 500 pounds or a one web satellite at 350 pounds to an older GPS satellite at 8,500 pounds. And you get the idea. This allows SpaceX to launch 60 Starlinks at a time while one web launches 36, 36 in each launch. And that's with the uh, smaller SpaceX Falcon 9. The final factor in lowering costs for these low Earth orbit, low Earth orbit internet constellations is the recent development. The use of lasers to mesh network communications between satellites has dramatically reduced the requirements for down, ground down, downlink stations and allowed for them to be located in more convenient and cheaper locations. It also allows for smaller receiver antennas and many other network performance enhancing features, higher speed, more security, lower latency, and so on and so forth. All of which translate into improved performance and further cost savings. So, with an unprecedented demand for high-speed, low-latency internet services around the world in regions where it was previously not available or affordable, 
and in the, re in the recent appearance of a solution to that problem in the form of low Earth orbit satellite networks, the stage was set for swarms of new satellites to populate Earth orbital space. Further aggravating factor exists in that there is currently almost zero regulation of commercial activity in low Earth orbital space. In order to currently register or reserve orbital space, a company needs merely to obtain frequency band allocation from the FCC in the United States, the International Telecommunication Network or union in, in the rest of the world or another national agencies, none of which are coordinated with each other. This list from uh, the, an earlier slide, shows the planned low earth, the planned low earth orbit, low latency, high speed internet systems that have achieved this planned status by obtaining this bandwidth, bandwidth allocation. Thus, many of these players or companies that claim to be in the game have merely staked out a claim and only Starlink, Telesat and OneWeb have actually began to employ their constellation, not constellation as a July of 2022, and only Starlink is operational partially at this time. However, on April 5th of 2022, Amazon's Project, project Coupier, Jeff Bezos, has issued a procurement contract of $10 billion, the largest in history, for three companies for 83 launches to insert 3,236 of their satellites in the orbit. This is a very capital intensive business. And to some, perhaps many of these systems may not materialize or may modify their plans. On the other hand, new competitors seem to pop up every time we search the web, the internet. And I, I'd just like to stop for a moment at this time. One of the emails I got just two days ago from Jack, Jack Brisbane, had a, uh, a uh, table in it uh, from the United Nations. The United Nations is studying this very thing now. And there's a quote in it. I have a slide toward the end of the program that I'll show you. There, there was a quote in this thing that uh, talking about what's going to happen in the future that, that, that says that registration for satellites in the year has, has already been approved in the year 2030 for 1.7 million Wow. Some of many of which will be built. <laughs> so this compelling commercial example of free enterprise began to roll out. The astronomy community began to realize what that what had been a sometimes entertaining nuisance, radium flares, had developed into a potentially serious threat to pollution in the night sky and that there was little they could do about it. Some mitigation efforts have been tried by SpaceX with their Starlinks to no avail up to this point. They painted satellites black to lower their visibility, but that caused the satellites to overheat. They then tried putting sunshades on it, but the shades blocked the laser signal between the satellites. So while efforts continue, they are what they are, band-aids on a major wound. To quote Andrew Williams from the European Southern Observatories, quote, the main problem for astronomy is that there's almost zero regulation. The current regulatory landscape is not fit for these massive satellite projects, end of quote. This is an international technical problem that competes with a number of other interests, astronomers, satellite companies and others are working to develop policies to address the competing issues, but there are high financial stakes involved. According to Connie Weber of the National Science Foundation's Neuer Lab, which is the umbrella, uh, the umbrella organization for our, uh, the United States Observatories, astronomy has been given, has been given an agenda item on this year's 2023 meeting of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. He says, quote, 
this is quite a feat that we are on the agenda. But I'd add it's a few years late. I'll come back to the astronomical and light pollution. <laughs> but I'd like to discuss for a moment a directly related, much more attended to situation, what we entitled the orbital debris traffic problem. This subject, which has received attention since 1978, when a paper written by Donald Kessler entitled, quote, Collision Frequency of Artificial Satellites, the Creation of a Debris Belt, end of the quote. Define what has become known as the Kessler Syndrome. Kessler described what he saw as a time in the future, he suggested by the year 2000, when the density of objects in Earth orbit could increase which would increase the likelihood of collisions, which in turn would have an outsized impact on the orbital environment, increasing the probability of still further collisions, thus leading to the growth of a belt of debris around the Earth. And this slide has shown a slightly updated version of a chart I showed earlier, which characterizes the density of tracked objects. Those are over two to four inches like a cell phone. And then the estimates of smaller objects now in Earth orbit. Many of these smaller pieces of debris are results of breakup, explosions, or collisions. There's been some estimate that there's been 570 events over the history of space, uh, uh, orbital space. Even small objects assume a much more significant role when one considers that the velocity that they are traveling at is often more than 10 times the velocity of a 30 out six flight. Thus, can have an enormous amount of kinetic energy, enough for a bolt fragment or a rivet to put a hole in the ISS. Two major collision events have resulted in about 7,000 objects or nearly one third of these track fragments. They were the 2007 Chinese anti-satellite test, which was at 540 miles altitude, and the 2009 accidental collision of an Iridium satellite with a Soviet Cosmos satellite at 500 miles altitude. These con collisions contri also contributed hundreds of thousands of smaller untracked fragments. All of these objects will stay in orbit for decades to come. You may also remember just about a year, just over a year ago, the, the November 2021, the anti-satellite test by Russia, which contributed another 1,500 trackable fragments, along with thousands of smaller pieces, mm -hmm. causing warnings for the ISS and creating a major uproar in the world science community. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the ISS, it has been forced to take satellite evasive action some 29 times in 1999 and 2021, including three in 2020. With its altitude of 516 kilometers, the ISS is competing directly with Starlink's band of orbits, which are between 325 and 580 kilometers. Hubble, by the way, is at 536 kilometers. In May of 2021, this hole in the station, in the ISS station's robotic, robotic arm protective cover was caused by a five millimeter fragment, suspected from 2007 satellite anti, and Chinese anti-satellite. Extrapolating the escalating effect of satellite debris density suggested by the Kessler syndrome as accelerated by Starlink and its competition, it is reasonable to raise concerns about a scenario in the near future where the overall density of the orbital objects, operation of satellites, defunct satellites, unaccountable pieces and fragments may reach a potentially untenable level. We may soon run out of space in space. <laughs> Think about it. This situation has caught the attention of 60 odd space sparing nations and space companies around the world, not so much because they're concerned about us astronomers, 
but because of safety and insurance implications. A lot of ingenuity is currently being expended to come up with practical and cost-effective ways to clean up the non-functioning orbital objects, fragments which have been given the name Space Debris and Space Junk. The European Space Agency has been a leader in this activity early on and has drafted procedures which have been used by the UN as space debris mitigation guidelines, which have in turn been used as the baseline for international standards for satellite end of life control going forward. If you clean up the current situation and deal with future accidents and such, practical solutions are still being sought. Some ideas include nets, harpoons, grapplings, feathers, suction cups, magnets, sails, lasers, and some other exotic proposals, but none of these have yet been demonstrated to be effective and practical. The suction cup worked in the vacuum. Okay. How does the suction cup work in the vacuum? Interesting. That's a good question. <laughs> In September of 2000, um, in September 2019, the European Space Agency issued a $150 million contract for a project called, quote, Clear Space to create a, quote, tow truck for failed satellites. Not to be outdone, in May 2022, the brand new U.S. Space Force, as part of its space sustainability activities, called the, quote, Orbital Prime Program, issued 125 contracts for $250,000 each in a competition to demonstrate cleanup and management technologies. The finalists will compete for an award for awards of $1.5 million dollars to continue their demonstration work. Let's hope that solutions will come sooner than later. So, how do us astronomers deal with this developing scenario? Can we live with the increased streaks and night sky glow from thousands of new satellites? The best we can do at this time is to try to understand what is happening, and what we can and what we can't do with the situation. The first thing to do to understand is that this new type of internet connectivity and the satellite constellations that go with it is a new reality which may become the dominant internet system in the world in the very near future. If SpaceX's Starlink system continues its current rollout, meets its promises for even better service at lower cost, the die will have been cast. Amazon's Coupier system is certain to follow. With Amazon's, Amazon's Jeff Bezos' recent $10 billion investment in launching it, along with several others that I have mentioned, we, we have, in a few years, we will have three to five times the number of low Earth adult and low Earth orbit satellites as today is still growing. Apparently, China is really cranking up the effort in this too. They don't want Bezos satellites invading their territory or Starlink right? The orbital light pollution problem, which is already a nuisance to some astronomical operations, will continue to become even more challenging and will begin to affect more of us. To what degree? We shall have to wait and see. Some recommendations going forward to the professional astronom astronomical community and to a lesser degree to us amateurs are shown on this slide. In every possible way, we should encourage fewer satellites from fewer companies. From our perspective, it might be good if Starlink dominates the market and its dominance discourages other potential companies. We might then negotiate with one entity who has already shown a willingness to work on the mitigation of In any event, we should be proactive in working with the satellite companies in mitigation strategies. 
We should also strongly support all efforts to find solutions to clean up and diminish the current clutter in orbital space debris. And finally, we must support the creation of appropriate international regulations to control the use of orbital space surrounding our planet. If this does not occur, we may soon suffer from orbital space chaos. To quote an astronomer from the magazine article that I mentioned earlier, the growing population of satellites is, quote, an existential threat to astronomy as we have known it throughout the ages. And now, if you please join me in a musical comment regarding this problem. The credits to Richard Rogers for his melody title vice from the sound of music. I'm not quite stable with my guitar with, without uh, my grace on. Ah. Use the words here, okay? And you'll remember the melody of this song, so I appreciate it if you'd sing along. <laughs> It seems to me that space is this Into businesses, business, I, I, it's almost a system, mobile, you buy one from your RV or camper, your, you know, sailboat, if you will, maritime cruise ships are now receivers, aviation, airlines have adopted Starlink systems, the internet or the new internet flying, military, world affairs, Ukraine was, was given 20, uh, 20,000, as I recall, stations to use in their efforts in battling the Russian so that they can have internet connectivity, which has been quite useful for them against. And, and now they're trying, they're talking about setting up a cell phone, uh, low earth orbit based cell phone uh, system. Somebody's going to make a lot of money. So, yeah. Kind of know that. Oh, this one, if you see, that's bad enough now. Just look at this. This, If we are blindsided by, by these internet systems here, what will happen? There's no, there's nothing that will prevent advertising in low earth orbit. This is a system that was suggested by a Canadian company, which uses LEDs on, on a, a low earth orbit satellite to to uh, display ads and so on and so forth. The uh, next one is a Russian. We can put a Starbucks sign out there and we'll work over. Now, how, how about uh, being out there at the dark sky site and trying to look at a, at a 
Keep sky object from one of those up. At least the below yeah. balance. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, right. You could get you can get the race in one of uh, this is uh since I produced this presentation here last year, this is a report that came out toward the end of last year in the GAO, the government uh accounting organization, like a 65-page document which which uh, examines and, and uh, has produced guidance to Congress uh, about this subject. And just a few days ago, I got this document uh, for Jack, and I was amazed by the quote that I got at this opinion, which says that using the criteria I talked about in this report, that by 2030, there will be 1.7 million satellites authorized to, uh, to go into low Earth orbit. For this, these are a couple more documents that I received, one from Jack and, and one from a, a young lady. I forget the name of my I believe Trump was on the lowbrow uh, in the lowbrow network about uh, uh, an industry study that is looking at with, at the Starlink system and about how you can do things to, uh, to mitigate the, the situation. Uh, yeah, the rest of these are just. So, does anyone have a question? Has uh, uh, GeoSync now considered uh, too far away for modern communication? Well, it's good for some communication, but the latency factor is a major thing. That's what. That's what the game changer was when uh, when, when uh, Musk and SpaceX figured out how to do it economically. Of course, before before the reusable rockets and stuff that, that, that SpaceX was involved with, it's too costly. But now it's economically possible, anything that's possible, and has a market value. Is there any regulation or well, no? Is there any proposed regulation that has been like put in Congress or just like tossed around as a way to solve this, or is it just in the talk about it phase of this case? Publication I showed you about study looking at it and it's giving guidance to, to Congress. But if we did it here. Not to say that any other company, you know, there's 60 some countries out there that do this and they are not bound by anything. Mm -hmm. So it, typically, I mean, you would think it would have to be a UN effort and going to be full of all the bureaucracy in 60 some countries, mm -hmm. a lot of money, and uh, you know, uh, any other. Crazy question, but it's actually a serious one. How much does it cost nowadays to fly a, a uh, telescope um, in the moon's orbit? The low Earth orbit? Not low Earth, but moon moon orbit. I can actually, I, I might be able to put something as um, very, there's not a lot of, because you need a medium lift launch vehicle or heavier to get to the moon. And your costs, um, pun intended, astronomically go up uh, because you're not just getting it lower and lower, you're getting it past TLI. And I can quickly check if you'd like uh, pounds to uh, lunar orbit if you'd like. Uh, just curious because the only other way, if we don't regulate what we can see from Earth, is to get above it. And those costs are very prohibitive. I have no idea if those costs would ever go down or up or something, something else. I know light sail is a is something that the Planetary Society does. So it's a low cost device that they shoot out into space. And they're talking about using it to travel to um, to other systems by pointing a laser. But how do you get a telescope out there if you want to observe without streets of satellites? I've been to Texas Star Park. Went all the way out there. It was a wonderful event, but, but because the skies are so dark, 
you can actually see your shadow by the milky way. That's <laughs> blew my mind. And we, all of us, travel into dark sky sites. Right. Why have you done funky tests? Well, we've been doing this for thousand, two thousand. Back in the, the old days, back when there were all kinds of sites and everything, uh, they had no light to it. What, what, what will happen? What will happen? What will happen? You can see naked eye that require at least a small binocular spotting skill. Look what Charles Messier did from downtown Paris. Look what Galileo did. You can't see. Galileo did with a little thing. But, at, you know, in 10 years, 15 years, that'll be after life. This may all be gone. You may, you, you may not be able to go out and you know, walk out here to your local park or your local what we call the dark site and do that. Well, we already see the numbers going out. Mm -hmm. I do my readings. Um, we still get 20, we got a 21.9 or 9.5, I think, and uh, yeah, okay. text. Yeah. That's, I go out to the places that used to say they were portal three. And uh, numbers are all smack dab in 404. 21.4 is the highest I've gotten in the thumb. Most of the time, it's 21.2. And on a good night. So those numbers are dropping. I wonder if Mr. Musk has occurred to Mr. Musk that all this junk uh, orbiting the Earth by 2030 is going to take down his mission to Mars. <laughs> yeah, they won't be able to launch it because it'll get hit by something on the way up. That, that was a question that, because you, you barely skimmed on it, that every launch not only puts that object up there, it puts garbage up there. Nuts, bolts, and so on. So they're going to reach a, a, a saturation point Apparently, there just haven't been many studies on it. They're going to reach a saturation point where you can't put anything up because it's, it's they'll just be constant collisions, from, from, probably from nuts and bolts and. and China's go, gonna go along with that. China's gonna say yes, sir. Because there might be a density, and I know you got my stuff and YouTube Dimitri, but there might be a density at which you're at the point where you've got the type of communication you want. And if you go beyond a certain point, there's no need to put more satellites up because it becomes overkill. Uh, would that be a possible whenever you've got the competition? Somebody else is going to be trying to point in on that and make the millions of bucks. It doesn't matter. The the HS versus the the there's another yeah, but the thing, the thing, the thing, the point, well, the thing they can do right is we have technologies today that we would just decide to make the, the land based, uh, we open up the bandwidth, but we have speeds, and it turns out that very few. People, very most people live in very small space. So you like they were going to launch balloons over a couple of cities, right? And that would be, be uh, taken down to Starbucks, but the problem is we had weather problems. Like that. But today we have terrestrial based answers. The people are fighting all the time. You know, we would turn that up to his behaviors. Okay? Well, what happened is we'd still have a Starling, but we wouldn't have hundreds of thousands of them. Yeah. You know, we would still need it to get to Uganda and the rural areas. And right now, so have you looked at the pricing of Starlink? It's around yeah, yeah, yeah. $7.99 to start. It's it is a great deal. It is a great deal. I mean, a T1 line used to cost $700 a few years ago. It's <laughs> not even if you're a person, but if you live out in the middle of nowhere, I have a buddy out in Arizona. They 
I don't have enough faith in human nature to think that someone would say would reach saturation like, oh, we have enough. Yeah, <laughs> Bezos is going to say, I'm VHS. And Musk is going to say, I'm Betamax. <laughs> I think that's better. Well, that's a different problem. Yeah. So to answer your question, right now they do track all these objects, mm -hmm. and launches have been delayed because of. Satellites and stuff coming by. Yeah. So you do check as much. Mm -hmm. And Starlink satellites do have a system to yeah. do whatever. Right. Right. They do. Uh, yeah. What we need is like ATC for space. I'm going to be on how you go. Every one of those things is resulting in components of small. The right thing. The situation we need to pay attention to and do whatever we can about it. And the one way that it may happen, that may end up becoming in the next few years a political issue. Then you're going to have one side that calls for the deregulation and it's on the side of the astronomy community and the other side that wants to pull, pull force for, you know, make internet better or things. So what will end up happening is you'll end up, it'll end up in legislation and you'll try to vote the right folks in office that will take steps regulating. So 10 years from now, you have to see who your candidates are and if they're advocates. There is a space advocacy program um, planetary society. They're in government meetings. They talk to the rest of the members about funding that's given out to NASA and other space initiatives. That's why there's a probe going to Uranus. Maybe I just have to take exception to this. This may become a political Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Because the problem well, the thing is one way to slow things down, make it a governmental issue and say you all have to regulate it. Now, can we control what China and others do? No, we can't. But we can't put international pressure though. You can try and put international pressure. Hopefully you don't see the lack. In a world of sin, yeah, that was a whole other problems too. There's an international treaty that covers all the seas. Oh, there is. Are in the right. right. Yeah. It's obviously inadequate, okay. but <laughs> almost every nation that puts anything out the sea is a signatory of that organization. Uh, same with Antarctica. Uh, so these <laughs> diplomatic avenues do exist, and the countries that were most apprehensive about, including Russia and China, they're all part of it. So it's not like there's no precedent to getting things done. Does SEC uh, uh, reach up to the uh, beyond the stratosphere? The SEC uh, does that uh, reach above the stratosphere for regulations? It's the only real regulatory body that covers it. And I didn't mention it, but, but it is a major issue because the radio is not <laughs> I'd just like to thank you all for inviting me for the presentation. Probably uh, will. Yeah. Let's make it two years. <laughs> Now you've got another one to practice. Come back next year. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
back up to the campus again. So, um, <laughs> Yes, we did talk to you that in the Okay. Uh, so, officers, maybe I just have a couple things. Uh, first thing is I wanted to thank Sheila and Amy and uh, in particular for the one that the website. So Jim kicked it off and everything, but uh, and, uh, Amy had just been talking away, cooking his arms and minutes, all that stuff in there. But did you just want to camera? No. I'm not thinking you did, so anyway. But much no, more you know, my two cents, but I that's what I was saying. Oh, yes, that's what it was. <laughs> anyway, just a shout out for them for the fine work they've been doing. A reminder that next month we're going to do our annual trip over to Scherzer Observatory at EMU. And some of you may not even remember this, but since COVID, you know, we didn't go there for a while. But what we didn't bring back yet, and we're going to do is free pizza. Yeah. So we're going to do the pizza cookies and all that stuff like we we're going to bring it back. Don't try to order pizza. You got to prescribe it so no one doesn't go crazy. And that's it. But he's got to well, so. Uh, and just a couple of days ago, I got a box from the Night Sky Network. I kind of knew it was coming, and it was, I forget how they described it. There's a whole bunch of posters, basically. And I mean, this thing must weigh 15 pounds. It's just a box like that, but my God, is it heavy. And it's like I looked at one, the top one is a picture of a couple of interacting galaxies, and on the back they have information about it. So I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe that's something to give away to astronomy at the beach or something. Anyway, we'll figure something out on us. I want to get them up because these things are heavy, but uh, and we have an open health schedule for tomorrow night. The last I checked, the weather we still look good. When I get home, unless that's changed, so I'm probably going to dare to go ahead and call it a go yeah, tonight, and then watch what happens. Okay, sitting here, here I'm going to the yes, end. thank you, Jim. Yes, let's see it. Okay, cool. We got a couple more now. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, wait, I should count those. How many hands were up? We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Let it be reflected in the yeah, it went through about five telescopes because Vanessa's with me, Jack one of the McMath. And Brian's coming going to do a projection on the uh, observatory wall. So that covers like a lot of people at the same time. So we might survive them. But this is the skips. That's what I said. Maybe checking the smoke. Um, I was about about that. Yeah. My opinion on open houses and the smoke is that, you know, we've scheduled the open houses. So we show people what we can do. To smoke. Yeah. Uh, I mean, unless it got to dangerous levels and we can see. Yeah, if it, <laughs> that if it's the ground level, we're getting right. ozone and PM25. Um, then yeah, we, we have to call it off. It yeah. wasn't like calling it off because it's cloudy or too cold. Which is really a reason maybe I shouldn't have called it tonight. Well, I can tell you right now, the smoke forecast I'm looking at is green up until sunset. And no, it just goes to slight yellow. I don't, the red and purple are not going to make it. To, to Peach Mountain before we uh, shut down, we should be right. So it's a GRA, yeah, part of the tape. That's the other side of that outreach, right? That's, that's atmosphere. They started doing the smoke and fire. As far as clouds, the state of Michigan told me. Okay. So officer reports uh, Amy sent an email saying that she was not going to be able to attend. Uh, Jeff is working with his band to make more money for guess what? Strong equipment. <laughs> uh, Jack. Oh, okay. Uh, just a few quick things. 
Oh, in the observatory, we had a few things to replace again. Just a uh, oh, broken lamp for the heat lamp. Uh, it's lamp-based metal parts. We had to buy a new one. Then just replace some of the red light bulbs. And there is a new multicolored red light bulb in the observatory. So you can change it and see things when it's dark in there. Red sometimes, so okay, but not really good. Anyway. So we went ahead and fixed the uh, old yellow ladder that we had. So you might remember seeing this in the observatory for many years. And we took it out in parts. There's a reason for that. I'll explain that in a couple of minutes. And in the meantime, uh, we did go back and I did get the uh, Celestron Star Hopper back from uh, Dave Shindell. That's back in the observatory now, and the this has been updated for the uh, telescopes that are there. So you're going to see in here. I've also got another one. Uh, you go inside the observatory, you're going to see about four or five different telescopes sitting in here. So you're not going to have that many people running around in the observatory until mm -hmm. we figure out what we're going to do here with all these. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can see both of them, the 8-inch F6 is back, the you know, star hoppers there. 8-inch F7, which has a Bluetooth, you can hook up to your SkyFi, uh, which is kind of cool. And then the 17 and a half, and you can check those. Well, that's a good camera right here. And uh, we did not have picture that... Uh, that Celestron 11 inch with the big CGX mount. I saw that in there too. That's the, yeah, it's a Celestron 10, it's the old 10 inch. Yeah, I owe a uh, Wi Fi unit that I used with it and it worked really well. And I'm not using it for anything else. So my plan is to bring that into you and uh, it can just go with that scope. Okay, that's that the 10 inch you're talking about. Yeah, the 10 inch. That will okay. allow remote control with your smartphone for that big scope. Okay. Uh, the only other thing is we had a discussion about one of the mounts in the observatory uh, it's for the 8-inch Cassegrain. It's an old cave mount. And when we were out there that we did tear it apart. Yes, it does work. So you can get some working on that. Other than that, that's about it. Uh, we've been doing some other work on just temperature testing on the like math mirror, see if we can get down some of the uh, Noise in the uh, atmosphere there, the turbulence in that. The other thing, the reason I brought this up now that I've got it fixed and repaired is we're thinking about making it available to anybody in the club that may want to make a donation. And the money would go to the club, send it to Dutch School. And uh, if you're in the local area, I can drop this off around your house. So it's an old style ladder. We'll see what happens, but if somebody's interested in it, I'll make take a little bit on it. And like I said, everything will go to Doug Skull Club Treasure. I don't want nothing to do with money. With those scopes that are the observatory, send an email out to the membership reminding them we'd like to borrow them. So yes. People, people don't know about them, people haven't thought about borrowing them. Yes, so thing, thing they sell some. maybe in the next news. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, this newsletter we can do. That. We still got yeah. I think just yeah. email to the membership. <laughs> and the, <laughs> okay. the other thing I think the club should consider is selling them some of those scopes at uh, larger basement prices. I can tell you that Warren Club has the same problem, they've got. Millions of jobs and shit, too. <laughs> really well, their thing about it brings up selling them as well. A good point because a few years ago, the six inch F8 cave telescope that we have, uh, Ken Rubel, club member, cleaned that up, drives a really nice scope. We had the mirror resurfaced and uh, recoded, and that's a nice scope, and that'd be one that you could usually get rid of. And that eight inch cast grain, I don't know. Uh, we need just more work on that, but somebody might want that too. So think about it. So, yeah, telescopes RS is coming to. <laughs> <laughs>
Cave mirrors were generally uh, uh, pretty good uh, quality. Yeah, we had this one recoded and the whole bunch. And that's all I have. So I'm going to let you go. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Don? Uh, I've got three books here. They're the original Scientific Americans, book one, two, and three, the Hanukkah Telescope in the 1962. I came upon them. Long story, but if anybody wants them, first person comes to the table. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, does that have a teacher? I have a reason. My yeah. physics teachers they have them hold, they have um, some blank knuckles like set up in two boxes, and they just gave it to me. <laughs> wow. So I actually need this. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> nice. For the upcoming eclipse, I play what sun planets are. This is a bad prototype. Uh, if sun finals require a projection, this projection membrane material to do a good one. I happen to have bought a whole bunch of it. So if anybody wants to make their own sun funnel, I've got some of the material here. You can just come and take a piece and take it. I've got five. If uh, more people want them, I'll bring more. Thank you, Don. So with the sun funnel, on the aperture, your scope. Make a smaller hole of that size, and then you project with an eyepiece, which is good here, and projects on the here. So, if you look at the May 2017 newsletter, there's a the first one I made, seems an article on it, and uh, that's what I did at the eclipse in 2017. It's nice when you have a group of people standing around before totality to watch the progression. Of the moon across the face of the sun, it, uh, it's a nice one. I mean, that totality is good whatever you want to do. That's all I have. Thank you, Don. Jim? Um, not a whole lot. Uh, I was uh, doing something on the internet and came across uh, an international event. On uh, June 24th, the uh, Back to the Moon. It was originally celebrating the anniversary in 2019 of uh, the landing on the moon in 1969, the 50th anniversary. Um, and they, the organization has been doing it ever since. And this year it's <laughs> Uh, a week from Saturday, and since we were doing that anyway, uh, I signed this up as part of it. Um, we've also talked about it's a it's a weekend event. It's you know any be part of it, uh, be out on the street with your telescope for on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Um, so some of us have talked about. Possibly be by the library or the hands on museum or um, in that church. even the church in Detroit um, on, on Friday or Sunday. Um, so that is something that's going on. You can look it up on the internet and sign yourself up. <coughs> um, and they'll put you on their little map of. Various uh, places where it's going on around the world. Um, and as far as this Saturday night goes, and I hope we've still got some people on Zoom. If you get a hold of me before tomorrow night, uh, my email's on the website, my phone number's on the website. I'll pull out the uh, 17 and a half inch telescope and show you how to run. Um, if I don't hear from you, I won't do that because I have my own 14 and a half inch telescope that's a whole lot easier for me to uh, move around, but uh, we need people that know how to run the 17 and a half. And so I'll show you how to run it if you uh, so desire. We lost the Zoom audience, by the way, but we got that one. We got that. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Adrian. Okay. Um, what are 
I should have just written them down. Um, I almost just want to say nothing to report, but there's a lot. We had the outreach that we attempted, so the clouds did cover uh, most of us at Hudson Mills Metro Park. Um, the Warren Club was going to go to an event, a camping oh, event. I don't know if it was the same Girl Scout event. No, no, it was that the group? It was the group that you ended up with. Yeah, and I ended up with that yeah. group. The Girl Scout event, um, five lowbrows. So kudos for coming out. Um, I don't know what happened with whether or not the Girl Scouts ever went by your scopes or did someone just the organizer and one other woman came over for a little bit. They gave us Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> that's <laughs> but you know, the scouts came over. They didn't scout. They didn't set anything up. We realized okay. that we all were sold. So I had the exact opposite thing happen in which the park folks told me that actually Tim from the board club, Tim Campbell, suggested it would be too cloudy. They weren't sure if anyone was coming out. And as it turns out, no one else from the Warren Club came out. But um, people still came over. I aimed a little spotting scope at a distant branch that resembled a bird. The kids looked through that. And then Venus made its appearance shortly after nine o'clock. And we looked at mm -hmm. that. So there were a number of people that got a chance to see Venus for the first time. And I told them, look for a little bitty crescent. So every kid there said they saw it and then questioned, and we answered questions about why the Venus looked like a little crescent. Um, so that turned out to be, that turned out well. I think I left around 10 o'clock that night when the clouds overwhelmed and the clearing that was in the Southeast covered up as well. And I'm no doubt the clearing came because the rest of us left. So we gotta remember that strategy in the future. Get two moves and then one of them sacrifices so that the other group will get a little sky. Yeah. It's like we used to do at Peach Mountain when one person would fold the telescope, see what happened, remember? Uh, yeah. It was 50% effective, actually. Yeah. So that pretty much outreach has been what I'm doing. And I haven't heard from the editor of uh, Astronomy Magazine yet, but. The article I wrote in my pictures were accepted. I was paid for it. And at some point, it'll show up in the magazine. I will bring that copy of the magazine and show everyone, or it could be next year. It could be at the end of this year because they already had a lot of things planned as far as what they were going to do. Do I smell a presentation to talk about? There may be a presentation. Oh, yeah. So, I'm always looking to grab something. Yeah. yeah. You can try to how to make money with astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now, was it a lot of money? No, but it was it was decent. Um, it was a decent check. You definitely have how to make money with astronomy. Fill out a lot of W nines because I've also <laughs> done, I've also done some presentations um, after. Many of you came to support the uh, presentation I did for the Ann Arbor District Library. And after that, I actually have a presentation. I had a presentation in Detroit, and another presentation is coming up for a different library in October. So, probably not highbrow, probably midbrow at this point <laughs> in the presentations, doing stuff. The Global Star Party, I'm constantly there it's on hiatus until july that's the one that i got invited to from david Levy. all people said bring it on let him show his images and that's where i met most of the folks like david Iker, some of the uh some of the professional astronomers come on there and then also astronomers from other parts of the globe and Global Star Party has slowly risen in the number of views that it's getting from its astronomers. It's online. Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific runs it. It's usually every Tuesday, <clears throat> starting around 7 p.m. for the big boys and, and big girls. And mm -hmm. around 10 or 11 is when the rest of us are, are doing our part, sharing our images, or some of them are doing live views from southern hemisphere so it's it's a real cool 
to be a part of the uh, part of that because Scott's trying to make Explore Scientific go public. He won't be busy until sometime in July. And once that's done, we'll pick it back up again. So I'll I'll try and make a better effort to share the times when that's gonna when Global Star Party's on and if I'm going to present. Most of the time I do. I try and make Tuesday nights available. Thank you, Adrian. And I still think that's funny you showed up with our other group because earlier in the week I got an email from the president of the Warren Club asking if we had anybody that we could spare to send over where you went. Because he was having trouble come up with anybody other than himself. So it yeah. turns out we accidentally did. <laughs> yeah, only because I'm in both clubs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, he was one of his own people after all. Yeah, but it just <laughs> turned out. I better mention this before I forget Black. We're looking for the donations now. Um, astronomy at the beach is going to, like last year, we're going to bring it back outside. And we're definitely in need of donations. Jeff's not here to. Um, Yes, but Doug left the meeting, Doug, our treasurer, but I think he was going to make a motion to make it 500 bucks, I believe. That's what we, that's what we did, low ground, what we did last year. Right. Oh, why both have we said 500 bucks for the astronomy? That's true. We're not. Second. All in favor. Second. Is anybody opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Chair. So. So it'll be both Warren Club and Low Browse so far will have between that there will be a thousand dollars donated, which should get us started for the reserve of the And then there are some other, there may be some other opportunities to come forth. We just have to see if then if they all work out. So I think I covered that. I don't know if it's too soon to talk about OP Techs so and we love if anyone else wants to. As you know, dark skies will disappear in 2030. You have not seen what a truly dark sky looks like. Um, OP Texas is one of those places in the United States that still will show you what that's like. And it's it's a lot different from what you may be used to. Is that just at the end of the Oklahoma Panhandle next to um, New Mexico and it Starts the Friday after Labor Day this year. It's great. So it's OG Tech Star Party, and you can find it on the internet. Adrian or I, or anybody else who's ever been there, can answer questions. You're, yeah, think, might think about going. You're trying to get it because it's not welcome. I think not trying to get out. I didn't Well, he came back like he wanted to get in. It was kind of messing with the knob. That's why I wanted to. Thanks, Adrian. And last but not least, Dave. Yeah, as Charlie mentioned, we've been copying stuff from the old website of the new one. Uh, the current focus is getting stuff off the members only um, section. And, Part of that is we've decided all the newsletters are not public. So they're not, you don't have to use them. Going to the private area is different. Um, going through all of them, occasionally find a little issue, Don helped with two of them. Um, and some of the other ones, there's this weird issue with the PDS. It may be the best thing to do is just go with that. Um, I don't know if there's a good solution to it. But uh, that I'm confident probably in the next week or two we be done with that part. So everything in the private area is either copied or we decided we don't need it. There's like web server logs from 10 years ago. So the hard copies. Hard copies I have a bunch. We have we kept like the store hard copies and then he gave it to whoever next became letter editor after Kurt. Well, a lot of it was not well I can tell you I got some I, I don't think I got anything directly from you but I got some stuff from Chris Arnacki and it's at a mailing label with you two guys on it. So some of them can't but well, that's why it is 
that you got from us. Oh, yeah. Because we mailed them out. So, so I help her back in No, we don't have them anymore. Oh, we have a folder in it. Okay. Yeah, we'll pull them out. Oh, you probably get to Chris. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I might have small ones. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to find out. Uh, I'm trying to clean out my apartment. And, uh, uh, well, we can keep up. Yeah. Sure. Well, I noticed we got several complaints from the Zoom audience about the audio. So they really yeah. were having trouble uh, hearing us. But yeah. Austin noticed that and has already sent an apology and kind of explained that. Apparently, they've been, they had some problem and been working on it. Obviously, they didn't fix it or made it worse or created a different problem. Well, I, I was, I was, I was going to bring that up because I saw the. Yeah, you saw it too. Well, it sounds like the handheld mic is ducking the other mics in the room. <laughs> Which well, makes that mic would work through here, but it wouldn't work through Zoom either. So apparently, but, you know, you know, you, I, I was in this business for 40 years. Yeah. You're not using that mic. <laughs> it's not made to be sitting down like this. It's made to be that far away. Well, yeah, but even when we did that, they couldn't hear us. I mean, we could put really? like that on it. There was nothing. Okay. Then so the only reason they heard so was also through the room. It is, yeah, his description says it's uh, it's ducking the, the ceiling mic. Which is normal. Yeah. It's good because it's, it's considered the instructor might, they want that to cut out the crowd. Or well, just think we won't be back here for a couple months so they got that long to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Florida, about a year to uh, update their voting machine to look what happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, okay, okay. One quick one. Um, in the issue of, uh, how the club started, there's people always ask us and that. If you go to the club's website now, go to the reflections area of the newsletter, go to the 1983 section, and it will be a February 1983 on the first Lobout freeze out. We list all the people that uh, gave talks there, which was kind of famous and another reason. I'll get to that in a minute. But in the front, that first page, uh, if you read that, it'll tell you about uh, how they actually started and why they started it, who was kind of responsible for it and that. And I know people have asked, some of us tried to explain it, but they do a real good job of it in there. It runs for it to explain it. And the other reason it became so famous, some of you probably know or remember, that the second uh, supernova, not superb, the second black hole discovered by a person from U of M, Ann Crowley. When she discovered that, she was also hooked up to give the lecture at the Low Rough Friso. Mm. That's what she talked about after just discovering that. That was kind of funny. Oh. But so go to the February 1983 issue and you'll like that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Jack. And it's on the new website, I feel. Oh, uh, new website. That's, yeah, the new one. Yeah, the new website. Yeah. Does anybody have anything else? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Second. Or anybody opposed? See you next month. Okay, all right. We are out. I didn't do it.